we're going to do a few videos on CSS performance, which is not often a topic that comes up in performance analysis. JavaScript generally gets a lot more attention when it comes to performance analysis because your CSS might be a few hundred kilobytes, your JavaScript with all your libraries and tools and extra load-ons will be megabytes worth. So which usually when people talk about uh, improving performance, they're talking about tips and tricks to reduce your JavaScript, both the actual size of it, but also deferring loads and lazy loads and ways you can do more to, to reduce the JavaScript size. It suggests that CSS is not as important with performance, but it's not necessarily the case. The actual size of the assets are often lower. Even when people load lots of external libraries, you're still talking hundreds of kilobytes. CSS is generally small. But the actual method or way in which CSS is passed on a page is, is render blocking. It means by definition, it, it kind of has a bigger impact on the actual initial load of your assets on your page. Let's go. So to really simplify the loading of a page, you're going line by line through the head and looking for any assets. If it comes across a JavaScript file, it's able to just ping off and make an external request for that file and then carry on working through. However, when you run into a CSS file, it has to stop. It has to suddenly stop, pass all those rules and won't continue to pass any further lines until it's understood all the logic about the layout, display and what things it's gonna have to do when it gets to actually rendering the HTML. Once it's loaded up all that information and you actually get to trying to lay out the page, CSS now has to do a whole bunch of stages in passing that information to work out what it can do. So for instance, uh, looking at firstly there's a rule about divs so now you have to think about all the divs on the page and how that might make them lay out then you suddenly have a header element and it's got a fixed top position so okay that's going to go up here then there's an element down here which has got a float position which means you've got to change the layout that's now going to go up here somewhere and we'd have to work this out but then suddenly you realize that top element has got a margin on it so you have to move that which means moving this down which means moving those other boxes down it means every rule because of the nature of cascade is going to involve having to subsequently change everything as soon as you find a rule that overwrites anything that was previously there. You really only want to do this once. It's why it's always recommended that your CSS goes in the head and really you try and minify the amount of uh, CSS files or even actual CSS rules you're putting on a page. You're trying to reduce the amount of actual time being spent doing that passing job. So the more CSS files, the more CSS rules, the more time it's going to have to take to calculate both the position of where all those elements are going to go on the page and also the painting phase for actually filling them in and producing the page that actually delivers on the browser. The thing is we often don't need it though. Most web pages are very long and very large. Uh, in JavaScript terms we often think about the above the fold content or about page splitting or we talk about ways of optimizing just the essential assets and the essential things you need to get that initial render. CSS is harder, although people sometimes will be able to split CSS and give you the essential for that page. Uh, you often are using libraries for you know, UI elements and so on, which are hard to then decouple page by page. But there is a way now we can start to reduce the amount of uh, calculation for what's needed on that initial render. There is a new property called CSS contained, and this can be applied to an element and will uh, convey information to the browser about the rendering of that element and all its children. So usually whenever something updates, you're going to re-trigger this process. So if you suddenly interject something into the screen or a color changes, you're suddenly giving information to say you need to do a repaint because something has moved. Uh, there are a few exceptions like the uh, opacities and the translations where it's able to kind of move those somewhat independently, but quite often a, a whole layout uh, redistribution is going to have to happen. With the CSS contain property, you're kind of able to identify an area of your page and isolate that from that constant trigger re-rendering process. So for example, you could, uh, if you have ads on your page and you really don't uh, think that their re-rendering only changes on those should subsequently change the layout of the rest of your page. You can specifically define that with a CSS contain property, either regarding the layout or the paint process and and basically scope that away. This, will, this should only really concern itself with re-renders of itself, but it shouldn't trigger re-renders of other elements. This scoping will enable the page to be more performant, trigger less re-renders, and generally improve the performance of your web page altogether. There's also a content visibility property, which is kind of gonna jumble some of those properties for you. So 
if you have a long page with lots of content that is below that fold or basically not rendered into view, you can set content visibility to auto and that way it will uh, know when it's in the browser and know whether it needs to render. Until then it won't be rendering, so again reducing that initial load. You can set your content visibility to hidden and essentially just suggest that this shouldn't be rendered. It's, it's almost equivalent to setting a, a visibility none on it. You're just saying this, this won't be rendered in the page even though it does exist in the DOM. So I don't know, something that's going to fade into the page or if you have some sort of single page app, something where you need to control that the element is there but it's going to eventually be rendered into the page, you can reduce the amount of uh, work on the browser to load this by giving it the content visibility property. There's a kind of an argument there where you could say maybe you should just use it on everything, just set that to every single property uh, and that's probably a bad idea. I suppose it, it has um, it has similarity when you think of through it of uh, the memo functions you get in React. Sometimes you get a React memo on a component which essentially lets you specifically define when it should re-render rather than just constantly triggering off render cycles for any tiny change. You're able to say no, it should generally hard cache until some explicit properties change. You're sort of doing a version of that in your CSS with your browser, you're sort of selling this element needn't really cause re-renders and re-triggers, it should really only be concerned with itself. Uh, putting it on everything, you are possibly invoking more problems than you need and this is probably something that you need to be quite confident about using or trying to solve an actual rendering issue when you come to it. It's just worth thinking about because this is a, a native CSS feature. There are so many ways that people uh, separate their CSS these days, whether it's by a, a naming convention like a BEM or some CSS in JS that's going to give unique uh, prefixes to elements and you're trying to avoid any scoping issues and you're able to separate out elements. But this, uh, this way you really are using a component like logic on the browser level. You're not just setting a bunch of CSS with some rules that should keep you safe, but you are able to really create a component like logic in which elements have control over their own distinct uh, rendering capabilities. That should make your web apps kind of more neatly scoped but also more in line with that component logic. Generally at the moment people people generally work in that mindset but then everything you do then gets compiled into one big fat JavaScript file which then works in a browser and that is somewhat lost. So here it's quite nice to think there's a technology that is embracing that component level thinking about uh, performance of your, your applications. Anyway, that's it for now. We're going to have a look at a few more things in a kind of performance topic, including performance, the Google metrics, uh, techniques for creating optimization and ways of optimizing your CSS. Uh, I'll include some links though about the content visibility and the contain property in here. It's worth checking out, I think. That's all for today though. Have a lovely day.